I want to spend a little bit of time thinking about the rhythms of life that God established for um, his ancient people, which are still relevant because we are still people made by God and living in the earth today. And um, we looked at how God established a day um, to focus on him, the day of rest. It was called Sabbath, Sabbath. And um, what happened when Jesus came as God and yet human among us, he transformed those old ways of living that God had established for his people and gave them dimensions of spiritual truth for those who are to enter in. So we saw last week how Jesus quite deliberately, often, you can read the Gospels and check up on this, often Jesus healed on the Sabbath day. And he did it partly to make people face up to a false religiosity. Quite deliberately, he offended formal religion. He even told, we looked at it last week, a man who um, he healed at the pool of Bethesda, take up your bed and, and carry your bed. He knew they wouldn't like that. And sure enough, the legal religious people reacted. Reacted so badly that even from early in his ministry, they wanted to do away with him. And he was offending their sense of religion and gave a whole different dimension to the truth of entering into rest. In a very real sense, the rest of faith spoken about in Hebrews isn't one day of the week. It's a place we enter into God and cease from our own efforts and works. However, just to finish that whole story off, we are created beings and there are rhythms to life. And there is a great danger in, in not living in a godly way. And God says, rest one day a week. There are stories of people who have lost their sanity by never taking a day of rest. It's not a good thing when a society loses that day set aside to the Lord and it gets eroded. But there are other rhythms to life. The um, whole of um, the, the lifestyle, let's call it that, that God established for his ancient people. Now, now in those days, life was agricultural. And um, the, their rhythm of life was established ar around um, the fields that they had to work in. And there were three great feasts. They're called pilgrim feasts. You'll find this all in Exodus chapter 23. I'm not going to read it today, but they were Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles or Booths. And they were, they were based around their lifestyle Passover was the very beginning of harvest time. Harvest time really still matters to us. It's just that we're not out in the fields in the same way. So we're not so close to what the farmers are doing. But boy, if the harvest fails, they'd know about it in Tesco. And you and I would feel the effects. So there were three great pilgrim feasts. The very beginning of harvest, Pentecost, was the end of the barley and wheat harvest. It was the fullness of harvest. And then the third feast, 
And it was the rhythm of their life. It was where their bank holidays were situated. They had a spring bank holiday. They had a Whit Sunday bank holiday, or well, a Whit Saturday. And they had a harvest festival. Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. The last feast was the, the feast of ingathering. It was the end of the harvest. It was when the, 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 the vines and the olives were ready for harvest. And it, the three feasts marked the rhythms of life of the harvest time. And they were called pilgrims' feasts because um, <clears throat> three times a year under the old covenant... And Jesus, as a human being, as Jesus of Nazareth, lived under the old covenant. And sure enough, when you read in the Gospels, at those three, those three great feasts of the year, their equivalent of our bank holidays, they were to go to Jerusalem. And Jesus did and kept the feasts. Now, Jesus lived as a human being under the old covenant. And as God and man, he brought in a new one. Amen. Paul, remember the apostle Paul said about himself, he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was a Pharisee. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. He was the best the Jewish nation of old could produce. Paul said, now Jesus has died and risen again. He is a true Jew who is one inwardly. Circumcision is of the heart, in the spirit. It changes everything. You don't need to go to Jerusalem three times a year anymore. We, believers in Christ, are in the new Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Paul didn't bother anymore with going to Jerusalem three times a year. He was off telling people about Jesus as far as he could go in the, in the world at that time. In fact... Years and years later, when Paul did finally, because Paul was quite prepared to be all things to all people. If I can win you to Jesus, I'll remember my Jewish origins. If I can win a Greek person to Jesus, then I'll speak Greek philosophy. All I want to do is get people into faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And when Paul eventually did make it back to Jerusalem and went into the temple, you can read, it's the story of the book of Acts, what Luke wrote for us. That was the end of Paul's freedom. The Jews arrested him. And from what we're told in the New Testament, he was never a free man again. He went from Jerusalem to years in captivity to Rome. Maybe he was freed, we're not sure. But what the New Testament tells us is that um, it only, the story only tells us that he was never um, a free man in Luke's account. So we both need to understand the rhythms of our natural life and the spiritual significance of all those um, ceremonies and feasts and high days and holy days that God set out for his people under the old covenant. So Passover was both a time at the beginning of harvest and was a reason for the nation to recall, Jerry's read and explained it to us already, we escaped from captivity. We escaped from bondage. God led us out. Amen. And, and we escaped from death itself. And they remembered the great occasion when they spread blood on the lintels. And God said, 
Just stay in your dwelling place. Stay in your dwelling place. Amen. And you will not taste of death. That's the biggest lesson of all for us. Jesus said much later on, there were those among the people with him who would not taste of death. Why not? Because they were dwelling in Christ. Amen. And that's what the Passover celebrated. Escape from bondage. Escape from being the servant of sinful things. Escape from being oppressed in life. Amen. And part of what was going on at the Passover was also because the people had to rush and get out of Egypt quick. They didn't take any yeast with them and they ate for seven days Jacob's cream crackers. Well, it wasn't cream crackers, but they ate bread which was unleavened for seven days. That became part of their rhythm of life for God's ancient people. And uh, for one week of the year, it still goes on. Um, they were to purge out from their houses, get rid of all the yeast, get rid of the old yeast. And they still keep it to this day. Remove all the old yeast. Have no yeast in the house at all. They have a little ceremony now whereby they leave a loaf of bread for a child to find. Somewhere where they'll find it and they, they grab it and they take it out the house. Get it out. Get it out. Get it out the dwelling. Out with the old. And then in with the new. Now Listen. Ye yeast, you know, is, is, is interesting stuff. I mean, you can, buy, you can buy cultures of it, can't you? Can't you? you can buy it in Tesco's. Is that right? I think you can. Yes, you can. But you can't actually, it's a culture. Yeast itself, you can't see. Yeast is an invisible thing. Yeast is in the air everywhere. Good yeast and bad yeast. I mean... The bakers used to keep, you can still find it in some craft bakers. You ever come across sourdough bread? And it's made with natural yeasts. If you leave flour and water out long enough, the yeast in the air, it's invisible, but it will culture and grow. And there's good yeast and there's bad yeast. There's yeast for, for bread. Now, we need to be careful here, but there's a certain kind of yeast which, which is good for, for brewing as well. Now, we're not encouraging drinking beer, but of course in the old days when water wasn't safe, they used to make a very, very, very weak beer called small beer. And the yeast is a good thing because it cleans the water. But then there are also yeasts which cause infection as well. There, there are bad yeasts as well. Now listen. Jesus said, beware the leaven or the yeast of the fat. Beware, beware. So he was describing over-religious formal teaching, not teaching full of the spirit of life and faith as something that if it got into your heart in the wrong way, it wouldn't do you any good. Um, there is one passage I'd like to read. If you've got a New Testament with you, um, can you read with me just a few verses from the first letter to the Corinthians? And it's um, Chapter 5, I'm reading from the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 5, and I'm going to read verses 6 to 9. Your glorying, Corinthian church, isn't good. Don't you know a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, 
was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Let's keep the feast. Paul did not mean, let's go to Jerusalem. He did mean, understand that Christ is our Passover lamb. And because of his death, we live by his blood. I enter in. And, and, and as for leaven, well, look what Paul is saying. Purge out the old leaven of malice and wickedness. Wrong teaching does not deliver the heart from, from malice and evil. Okay? It doesn't. Teaching which understands what Jesus has done, who he is, where he reigns, how he moves in the spirit to come to the human heart. Now that is good leaven. Remember, um, Jesus also said, the kingdom of heaven... What's the kingdom of heaven like? The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman hid in three measures of bread and a little leaven, understanding Jesus' teaching about the power of God to change our hearts, to take out wickedness. Put in life and faith and goodness. You, you are made as somebody who can love and love and love or you can hate and hate and hate. That's who you are. You, you, you're, you can, your life can be suffused, infused with, with a leaven which is from God, which is of a heavenly kingdom it can run right through your heart and life and make you a completely different person from that hateful person you used to be with the old leaven purge out the old amen get rid of it let god by his spirit, come into your heart and life and renew everything. A little leaven, just a little bit of faith. I believe a little bit of faith will leaven the whole lump. You know, you and I are made in such a way we, we cannot... Keep a little bit of sin. We can't, oh, I've got a little compartment there, which I've not yet taken before the Lord. It won't work. You might get away with it for a short period of time. But listen, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. You can't keep a little favorite sin and be right with God. He won't have it. His spirit will be grieved. You and I have to live without conscious or deliberate sin in our lives. Put it away. It's not that we're totally without sin any more than, you know, there's yeast in the air. There's yeast in the atmosphere. You and I are not without sin. But as far as conscious sin is concerned, put it away. Amen. Let the, and take in the new leaven, the new yeast. A little bit of leaven leavens the whole lump. 
Listen, if you honor Jesus, if you say, I, I know I'm a mess. I know I've done what I should not have done. And how does that old phrase go? I've not done what I should have done. And I've done what I should not have done. Well, amen. But we come to God. Amen. And just a little bit of faith, you'll be amazed at yourself. Honestly, you'll find that person who used to irritate me, that, 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 that difficulty I could not get over, that television program I should have stopped watching. You'll find you will. If a little leaven leavens the whole lump. You know, another way that Jesus put it is <clears throat> light shines in darkness it, the light light if you have a box of a, a box of darkness and a box of light make a pin prick between them what happens the darkness doesn't invade the light the light invades the darkness and it doesn't invade a bit of it it suffuses everything amen amen you and I, as human beings, were made. This is why God made us, unlike the apes. God bless the apes in their natural life. But you and I were made to be the image of God. For his light to shine in your heart and life. Amen. Amen. Our time has gone. Our time has gone. But let's keep the feast. No, we don't have to get on a plane. I mean, it might be very useful and instructive, and, but, but let's keep the feast. Amen. I've escaped from sin and death. I will try as far as possible to purge out the old leaven. And where I fail, God will come. He led the people out. He gave light in their dwellings. Well, I must stop. But one of the plagues of Egypt was three days of intense darkness. But there was light in the dwelling place of the Israelites. Amen. Shine into our hearts, Lord. Shine into our hearts. Let, let, let the light dispel the shadowy places. Now that's my prayer. I don't know about you. Would you say an amen to that? Amen. Lord, let your light so shine. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for ever being sacrificed in my place. Amen. Hallelujah. You became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. Thank you, Lord, that you have overcome and sat down at the right hand of, fa of the Father and are shedding forth your spirit, shining into the hearts of anyone who will just open the door and let your light shine in. Thank you, Lord. We intend to pass over into life, both when this natural life comes to an end and today. We will hasten and rush just as those folk had to rush out of Egypt we want to well to rush to you to not delay but to make you our Lord and our Savior keep us Lord in the difficult times and whatever we go through and yet your light so shine to the glory of God the Father in Jesus' name, 
Amen.